Ah, great, playful. First of all, who plays games? Fantastic. We've got to make this interactive because we're here having interactive. It's all very well me talking at you, but games are all about interactivity. So you see uh, Lara here when um, I was chairman of, of IDOS when we, when we launched Lara back in 1996, and I've been delighted to be her guardian through her life. But now, of course, she's left home and she's doing it for herself, so I wish her well. But I'm here really to talk about the power of play. I'm going to talk about why I find games so wonderfully exciting, what's is so um, compulsive, and what do children learn by playing them. Well, when children do arrive as babies in this world, they interact with it. They naturally learn. It's their natural education. They learn through interacting and playing for. We are playful by nature. And when we grow up, we learn to solve puzzles. We are problem solvers naturally. We have a natural curiosity to learn. When we apply rules to play, they become games. And I think games are wonderful. Uh, I bought my first chess set not long after it was invented in 643 AD. <laughs> and um, really enjoyed playing chess. And I was determined to turn my hobby of playing games into the business of making them. So I started a company called Games Workshop back in 1975 with two old school friends. Uh, the really handsome guy with the beard and the glasses, that's me. And there's John Peake in the middle and Steve Jackson, who I've uh, had a re remarkable relationship with as a business and friend all my life. We ordered six copies of Dungeons and Dragons from its inventor, Gary Gygax. And on the back of that marvelous order, we got the European distribution agreement for three years. Um, now, it doesn't look much, of course, but it opens up your imagination. It is theater of the mind. It's a role-playing game. It's a milestone in games. Here's a game where you role-play as a hero, a wizard, a cleric. You go on these fantastic adventures that another person's created, and you interact, and you learn a lot about yourself. And it's an amazing thing. And we were so amazed by, by role-playing games that we wanted more. So we went over to the States to sign up all the fledgling games companies. Uh, on the far, the silver-haired guy, that's Fritz Lieber. He's a famous science fiction author. Then Gary Gygax himself, the inventor of D&D. Professor Barker who invented Empire of the Petal Throne. There's me holding the boxes. And Rob Koontz, another games designer for D&D. For and Steve looking a bit grumpy at the front. Um, the worrying thing about this slide is that the first three guys on my right are all dead. And I'm next in line. But the... <laughs> But happily, I'm still here. Now, uh, also while we were in Wisconsin in 1976, we got to meet Miss Wisconsin. Um, I don't know what she's doing, but I'm here today, which is great. So we came back to... Um, <laughs> we came back to the UK, and we started up our little games workshop office. It was about the size of a bread bin. Um, John had left by that time. He hated the idea of Dungeons & Dragons, unfortunately, so it was just left to Steve and I. And uh, we, needed to, we ended up having to live in a van for three months. Um, the reason was that, because you, you try and raise some money for, for, for Dungeons and & Dragons. You go to the bank manager. Hello, we've got this great game. It's a role-playing game, which is a hero and wizard, and you kill monsters and you find treasure. And you, it lasts about 48 hours and, you know, could go on for weeks. And he looks at you, rather like an Alsatian watching television, and, us, and ushers you quietly outside the door. So, nevertheless, we carried on, determined to... to, uh, to carry on with our wonderful game, which we love so much. And we ended up opening our own shops because we couldn't get other people to stock Dungeons & Dragons. And this was the opening day of Games Workshop 1978. I'm still hoping to meet somebody who was in that uh, queue. If you're in that queue, please step up after we'll have a chat. Of course, uh, the world moves on. It is now the Bosnia and Herzegovina Community <laughs> Advice Center. <laughs> We wanted to take role-playing to a much wider audience, This because role-playing took a certain amount of time for people to play. So Steve and I mulled over this, fact, how could we branch out? So we created a concept, a new concept, of interactive game books. These were just solo adventures, and they were different to traditional linear narrative. These were games with branching narrative. They were a game book. Um, analog hypertext, if you like. So at the end of each decision, at the end of each paragraph, you have to make a choice: whether to turn left, turn right, kill the monster, 
not kill a monster, run away. So there was hundreds of ways of going through these books, but there's only one correct way. And children who wouldn't ordinarily read loved them because they were interactive. Suddenly they were empowered. And that's one of the great things about games and books, and these game books, is that they were empowering. The reader, in fact, was the hero. You, the reader, were the hero. This is all about you. This is not a passive, linear entertainment that's traditional in books and film and TV. Games are very empowering. They were, in fact, the fact what they say today was the gamification of literature, adding rules and dice to narrative with a game mechanic creates interactive entertainment. Of course, they were, everybody hated them in the media. Um, there was calls to ban them from the alliance, uh, the evangelical alliance, and because they were new, didn't understand them, they were interacted with ghouls and demons, had to be linked to the devil, of course. Uh, a worried housewife in deepest suburbia phoned in the local radio station and said that after having read one of my books, a child levitated. So everyone thought, <laughs> the kids thought, great, for one pound I can fly, we'll have some of that. <laughs> and um, a, a vicar um, threatened to chain himself to the railings of our publisher, who so outraged that these games were going to take over kids' minds. History has never been kind to games. In 1859, the Scientific American said, chess is a mere amusement of a very inferior character, which robs the mind of valuable time that might be devoted to noble acquirements. And when it comes to video games, the media has an apoplectic fit and is worried that it's going to be the moral decay of the children who might play them. They never stop to consider for one moment the power of good within games. It never enters their mind. If you'd never seen a film, if any of you had never seen a film before, and I took you to see Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Saw, and asked you to write a critique of the film industry, it's likely to be a little negative. It seems to me <laughs> that the people who write about games have never played a game in their life. So they assume all games are violence. Only 5% have got 18 ratings. The, the rest are perfectly family friendly. Who's played Angry Birds? See? Do you feel like you're kind of feeling a bit violent towards pigs at the moment? <laughs> no. And these are great cultural impacts on society. Grand Theft Auto V, released last week, a great British success story, had uh, generate a million, a billion dollars in three days in revenue is a great, significant cultural event. And even in Grand Theft Auto, you're learning manual dexterity. Um, and of course, seriously, problem solving, risk, and taking chances. So games, despite what the media says, has moved from a niche to a mainstream audience. <laughs> Children play games. Young people play games. Old people like me still play games. Everybody's playing games, and I'm delighted to see that, because games are social. There's nothing better than being in a room with like-minded people and having a bit of fun together. It's terribly social. They are cultural. Everywhere you go in public transport, people are playing games. They're enjoying games. You know, actually, there's, no, there's no point that you have to say, oh, you're too old to start playing games now. We'll put that away. That's kind of embarrassing, isn't it? Uh, and BAFTA celebrates the art form, and there's a BAFTA Games, which is brilliant to see. Games are motivational and have health benefits, whether you're jumping around playing Wii or using the muscle which is your brain, use it or lose it. You are actually solving puzzles and problems all the time. Games can be educational. You can use games as a learning tool in context and relevant to children's lives, teaching mathematics. So I would argue that games are actually very good for you because it's hands-on, minds-on. They're interactive. As I said earlier, you are empowered when you're playing a game. You're taking control of your environments. And this is a very wonderful thing to do. You're learning by trial and error. No child is, takes a rule book and starts reading it through. That's the old way of learning stuff. They're doing it by gathering empirical data by play, storing that information, processing it, and coming out with an output which hopefully leads to success. Games are problem-solving. In Angry Birds, if you just think about what's happening when you're playing it, 
You're learning about physics. You're learning about solving puzzles. You're learning about how you're going to overcome the problems that the game puts in front of you. And of course, games are very creative. Who has played Minecraft and who or children's got Minecraft? You only have to watch them, the, the worlds that they create, even though the art is neither here nor there, it's old-fashioned old 8-bit art. That's not important. The, most, the three things, when people ask me, what are the three most important things in a game? I will say, gameplay, gameplay, gameplay. <laughs> Technology and graphics play a supporting role. But at the end of the day, Minecraft is a perfect example of creativity in action, where they build worlds, they share it with their friends, and they get a great feeling of empowerment by doing so. Games are also contextual. In geography, you could say, OK, kids, let's do urban regeneration. And you can see the color drain out of their face. <laughs> and where you could use some, a game like SimCity in a very positive way, and at the same time they're learning, why can't learning be fun? Trial and error, it's a perfect example of what happens in the game. You're trying over and over again to succeed, and eventually you'll find a way. And by so doing, you will learn the right way. There's a, there's a story about a potter, similar to playing a game. A pottery teacher who asked half his class to make one pot to the best of their ability. He asked the other half of the class to make as many pots as possible. And of course, the best pot was made by the people who made many pots, because they didn't overthink it. They just got on with it, and through trial and error, they ended up with the most efficient pot. And that's the way, and that's the learning where we get in games. And of course, games are relevant. Um, President Obama recently said that Mark Zuckerberg's interesting games and playfulness of them made him want to learn how to program, and in turn, the output of that was Facebook. So the only death by PowerPoint slide, I'd just like to say, point out some of the things that games skills enable life skills, from interactivity, problem solving, cause and effect, motivation, intuitive learning, trial and error, they're engaging, they are creative, they build communities, they're collaborative, self-esteem, logic, hand-eye coordination, risk assessment, and of course, they empower your imagination. So, why don't we let kids do the fun stuff in school? Why does learning have to be dull? Why can't we let them do, make Lego robots in class? Why can't they let all the stuff they enjoy doing at home, discovery through YouTube, or peer-to-peer -peer learning, or learning how to play a musical instrument, or doing stuff that they really interesting like coding, let them do it in school in a collaborative way? <laughs> this is probably like my school. Things change, of course, but you can see they don't look very happy in school. Why is that? Because kids today are connected. They run their lives through social media. There's a shared world of intelligence and creativity. And yet, there are so many cases still where education remains in a broadcast model. This, to my mind, seems silly because it's so out of context and out of relevance to the way children run their lives. Where you see success is when kids collaborate. The output of these two kids working together is likely to be 30% higher than if they were in individual silos trying to figure out themselves. The old talk and chalk stuff doesn't quite work it anymore. Simultaneous equations, who can do them? <laughs> so, that's all very well for you smart Alex to 10%, but for the rest of us, this was torture. I've never been able to do them because this was learning mathematics in the abstract sense. What we need is more applied mathematics rather than pure mathematics. If there's a problem, what is that problem? How am I going to apply a solution to it? Then you do the computational bit, which has an output which is relevance. So how, off, how much does it take to move the pyramid from here to over there? How many trucks does it take? If you're just doing the computational bit in abstract terms, it has no context, no relevance. It's scary. I can't do them. Another thing that strikes me is that whilst we, in the UK in particular, are now concentrating on the STEM agenda, 
science, technology, engineering, and maths, of course we have to have rigor in those subjects. But at the same time, we must also have what we call the STEAM agenda, have art included in that STEM learning. So we've got a left and a right brains connected. We've got to have arts and humanities and sports. So we are rounded individuals able to operate in this world. And relevance, and, and bringing education up to date. ICT, those dreadful words, in information, communities, techn technology, has for the last 30 years been largely turning kids how to use technology, but giving them no insight on how to make their own technology. We bore them to death with Word, PowerPoint, and Excel. And yet the world in which they live is increasingly reliant on digital making skills. At the moment, we teach our children how to read, but not how to write. We know how to use an application, but not how to make their own application. They can play Angry Birds, but they can't make their own Angry Birds. A couple of years ago, Ed Vasey, our culture minister, asked myself and Alex Hope to conduct a review about ICT education in particular, because in our industry, there were simply not enough computer programmers to fill our industry. And we were not alone. All the creative and digital industries had a lack of high-quality programmers. And programming underpins the digital world in which we live. And we have to train children for jobs that don't exist. Theirs should be a world in which they hack their knowledge, collaborating, sorting out problems for jobs that don't exist. And it's imperative that we get our kids to code to be digital manufacturers of the future. Traditional manufacturing is pretty mature now, but for digital manufacturers in the world that they're going to have to operate, they're going to have to learn to code. And that can all be done with a sort of curiosity, allowing them to do it for themselves, having teachers as facilitators, learning together with the children to understand and operate in this strange world in which they will find themselves in. But at the end of the day, don't let's keep testing them in the same old way. I couldn't do very well in exams. And I think this little thing sums it up brilliantly, <laughs> that we are all different. And if we collaborate, our collaborative net output will be far better than any individual tested on the same basis. I'd just like to finish with a poem, not one that I wrote. It was by a Chilean. Umberto Maturana, and I think it's very apt for what I'd like our children to do, who gets get them inspired, let's get them collaborating, let's get them empowered and bring the workplace closer to the school environment. This is just an extract. Don't impose on me what you know. I want to explore the unknown and be the source of my own discoveries. Let the known be my liberation, not my slavery. The world of your truth can be my limitation, your wisdom my negation. Don't instruct me, let's walk together. Let my richness begin where yours ends. Show me so that I can stand on your shoulders. Reveal yourself so I can be something different. You will not know who I am by listening to yourself. Don't instruct me, let me be. Your failure is that I be identical to you. So we are different, we should be different, and as they say, great minds don't think alike. I'm just a young kid having fun, and I hope you are too. Thank you very much.